I do believe that we are live. Indeed we are. So good evening everyone. We are here to um, do a book reading this evening. We're here to read with you The Good Father by Benji Alexander of Raising Royalty. And um, we're only going to read a couple of chapters tonight. If you do not have the book, we can post a link in the comments so that you can go download the book and follow along. And um, then just, you know, after we read the first uh, two chapters that we're going to read tonight, we were just going to have any kind of discussion anyone wanted to have and continue tomorrow with... Uh, two more chapters and then the following day two more chapters and discussions after each one so <laughs> let me get what I need to get started here so if you guys were able to hear let us know if you're not let us know so we have some kind of indication that the volume is well So, The Good Father starts um, with a dedication and some acknowledgments, but I, we're not going to read that tonight. Um, I'm going to leave that, and um, hopefully you'll just go download the book and be able to read all of his wonderful dedications to his beautiful family and such, and um, that would be an added plus. Plus, there's some really great artwork in this book. Um, that's really neat to look at. So that would be another plus of having the book yourself and following along and being able to see the, um, the pictures. So, Josiah, do you have anything that you would like to say this evening? No, I think it's, uh, <laughs> I, I think it's a wonderful perspective on a, on a well-known story. And it's, it's a, this is a story worth reading, a story worth knowing. Yeah. Absolutely. That's always been one of my favorite ones. That's why um, I always bring up the, the prodigal son and how the father never even really mentions his 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 um his walking away. He just welcomes him back with open arms with no no question. It's a beautiful thing. But anyway, so we're gonna go ahead and start the reading. Um, again, if you guys do not have the book. Um, I will post the... Should I do that now, you think? Maybe? Yeah, maybe I should do that now. Let's get him. <laughs> we'll eventually get to the book. You're right, it, right. It's, it's the build-up in it. You're right. Can, can you feel it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Holy <it> Ghost. <laughs> Amen. See, that's why we should probably have to have some music going until we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> the Jeopardy theme music. Da, right. Da, 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 da. Uh, it's never impatience. Do Always thankfulness. Do. Yeah, see if nothing else, I'm helping you guys practice patience. I'm being super slow this <laughs> By leading evening. them into temptation, I see how it is. <laughs> no, just by being myself. Yeah. <laughs> just by being very, very um, slow and not thinking of things until the very last minute when I should have already had this thought in my head, so... But I think it's probably smart to post the link so people can go get the book if they do stumble across it and that they know where to go to get the book and that way they can follow along instead of waiting until afterwards. Mm. Um, so I need to go. Right. 
can always post it afterwards. Yep, I, I just found it. So oh, you found it? Good to go. That's because you're awesome. And this is the one that gives, actually, um, this is the link that gives two free books. So this is a great link to post here. And so I'm going to post it really quick and then we'll start reading. And I apologize for the delay. <laughs> and there's always a delay with me for some reason. It's one of my challenges I have been thinking about. Maybe I should be working on changing habits in that area. So um, I can tell you one thing. Benji has inspired a lot of thinking and a lot of um, realizing some things about myself that I didn't even know were there. So it's been quite the process already and we've just started this journey um, a little less than a month ago. So anyway, let me post this. Where is our live showing up? Here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll eventually get it together. There, there it is. is. Look, there's a just comment. There you are. Okay, so paste. There is the link. So. Good to go. Enter. <laughs> oh, I had to put my period in first. Okay, so we should be good there. Yep, that's it. All right, so now I need to go back to my book. <laughs> Let me find that. Let me find where I was at. Okay, so we're back to the book now. And I've just um, posted a link to download the book and it is free and you'll um, it's also a link to download another book that we'll be reading next month um, but this was one of our favorites um, it's, it's always been one of my favorite stories and one, one of my favorite stories in the Bible and Josiah loves the story as well and we were like okay well we want to read this book so why not let's read it um, on a live and um, let other people um, kind of see what Benji's writing is all about. We'll all be learning together, so here it is. All right, so this is the introduction. Jesus' most beautiful articulation of the gospel message, or the good news, as he called it, is found in Luke 15, 11, 32, known to many as the story of the prodigal son, or the story of the lost son. It could also be titled, The Story of the Good Father. I love that one so much better. When Jesus told this story, his audience was a crowd of tax collectors, sinners, probably addicts, prostitutes, thieves, adulterers, a whole lot of people who were all the black sheep of their own families, and grumbling Pharisees, religious people, who were offended by Jesus' association with all these sinners. Allow me to use some cultural context and a little poetic license to bring this story alive. Please also read Luke 15, 11 through 32 for the full Bible, biblical account. Should we open up Luke 15 or? All right. So we've got some beautiful artwork on, in this book as well, guys. So it's like I said, it's really, really worth downloading the book um, and joining the School of Sonship just to be able to, you know, um, um, learn and grow and, and challenge yourself to become more um, than you were yesterday and so anyway this is the first uh, chapter is called betrayal um, it says this story begins with a notorious event that shocks an entire village the outrageous news spreads as one of the hot topics of gossip beyond the village itself to the borders of the nation when wives caution their husbands you don't want to be like that incompetent father the husbands knew what they were hinting at when parents cautioned their children, you don't want to be like that disgraceful son, the kids knew what they meant. The scandal was household news. It was commented on at the synagogue and other public forums, where the strongest condemnation possible was expressed 
at the complete moral failure of both the father and the son. What was this scandalous news that was spreading from person to person and village to village? It was the news of a son's extreme rebellion and a father's tragic incompetence. It took place within a wealthy family in Israel, whereby in an act that defied the values of their entire nation, this son disowned his father and his family. This son insisted that his father give him his inheritance immediately. He wanted nothing to do with his father. He just wanted his money. The son didn't care if his father lived or died. The scandal was household news. In the context of Jewish, Jewish society and culture, honoring your father was one of the highest duties of a son. When Jesus' listeners heard that this son had dared to request his inheritance from his father, they would have seen him as one of the biggest scumbags on the planet. I can visualize a corporate atmosphere of disgust towards this son rising tangibly amongst the crowd. Even with all these sinners in the crowd, none of them are likely to have ever done something that in their eyes was so vile. In any culture, this would be one of the highest levels of betrayal and dishonor that a son could possibly commit against his father. These Jewish listeners believed the son in this story to be public enemy number one. In fact, they would have already been anticipating the next part of the story. They would have been anticipating the son being completely disowned and a punishment of death by stoning. At bare minimum, this son should be disowned and receive the beating of a lifetime. They would have been anticipating the father's wrath to be poured out on the son. Surely this wicked son was about to suffer the wrath of his father. In that culture, if there was a line to cross, which would incur immediate rejection from your family, this was it. Dishonor your father by telling the whole world that your father means nothing to you and you would prefer that he was dead. All he was good for was his money. The son had publicly disowned and dishonored his father. In their culture at that time, children could be stoned to death for dishonoring their parents. The fact that this father did not explode in a violent rage would have perplexed the crowd. It was a son's duty to honor his father, and it was a father's duty to discipline his son. The father's failure to punish his son was almost as much of a moral failure as the son's rebellion. It would have caused the crowd hearing this story and also the people in the story to perceive the father as a villain. Another piece of beautiful art wait, our artwork. <laughs> I love the insight with that because you never think that the crowd would see the father as a villain. You're right. But back in that day, he definitely violated law as well. And in, with the mindset of the scribes and Pharisees and the religious people of the day, right. you can definitely see where that, how that can be the perception. Right. How the world perceived him versus mm -hmm. how God perceives him. Absolutely. Very often our perceptions are off. <laughs> yes, God perceives him as a good father, and, yeah, and the world perceived him as a as a villain. Mm -hmm. So, um, the pictures on this book are really cool. <clears throat> so again, I definitely uh, recommend you guys download it. Okay, so we're going to move on. This tale that Jesus was telling these people was absolutely scandalous. It got under their skin. It was causing an emotional response from the hearers who were anticipating wrath and judgment. I mean, injustice. This father's failure to punish his son caused the crowd to judge him as a morally deficient father. The fact that this father did not follow the cultural protocol automatically set him apart as a very unusual father and a very bad father. As the story proceeds, we now have two villains in the eyes of the crowd of listeners and in the eyes of the people in the story, the rebellious son and the incompetent father. The whole village knew the family. Their culture revolved around community. They were a great example of the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Enforcing justice was a community responsibility. However, before the news got out to the whole community, 
And before they had time to get organized or gather their stones, the rebellious son had fled, not just to another village. The news of the incident and the resulting fatal justice it deserved would have caught up to him in another village. Not just to another region, the news and the justice would have caught up with him almost anywhere he went in the nation. The son fled the culture, fled the justice, fled the fear, the guilt, and the shame, and he kept riding with bags of money until he reached a distant nation. There would be no punishment inflicted on the father except that of ruined reputation. The whole nation passed a condemning judgment on this father as a bad father. Really great artwork again. More great artwork. And then we're to the next chapter that says loss. <clears throat> and I'm going to let Josiah read seats, yeah. lost. <laughs> we're so we are going to translate out loud things here. Right here. All right. So this, oh, this chapter is called lost. It says, Jesus goes on to tell, to tell us that the son wasted his wealth on wild living. The crowd surrounding Jesus would have been reading into that and assuming just as their older brother did, that he was hiring prostitutes and was without any moral compass. For this, for this crowd, the fact that he wasted the wealth of his inheritance was considered as wicked as sleeping with prostitutes. This young man is crossing every line of decency, and they want to see justice. They want to see punishment. With the escape of the son and the rumors of his twisted lifestyle, the story gathered momentum and and notoriety throughout the entire nation. Months had gone by. The father sat, sat in his seat on the porch again, alone, in the middle of the night. The servants had gone to bed, his eldest son gone to bed, but the father couldn't sleep. There was a bright full moon. The father could clearly see as he looked toward the horizon and, <clears throat> and the long dusty road coming from the village. He could see that the road was empty. He slowly drank his hot, warming hands on the mug. <clears throat> I'm sorry, he slowly drank his drink, warming his hands on the hot mug. His heart overflowed with love for his son. In response to his broken heart, a silent, glistening tear rolled his way slowly to the corner of his eye. The sun sat, upon, the sun sat up that night, too. The rumors were true. Actually, the rumors didn't capture even half of his son's lost story. Or, excuse me, half of his lost son's story. He had managed to keep his truly dank and defiling secrets hidden. The rumors did not betray how deep the excuse me, darkness was in this lost son's heart. The rumors did not betray how part of him wished he had been punished and executed. That he would at least be, be a, it would, that would at least be a permanent ex escape from a, an eternal world of turmoil. Now, how many of us looked at death for an escape? Mm -hmm. It's the wrong kind of death. Another wave of emotional pain brutally ripped right through him. Once again, he reached for his half-full bottle. A prostitute lay asleep beside him. She was a she was a sedative. She was a sedative to numb the reality that his heart was void of love. He liked her, but he hated her. He didn't even know why he hated her. He didn't process his own emotions deeply enough to understand that what it was really controlling them and what was really controlling him. But something about her made him angry. He wasn't aware that he hated her because he because she represented the fact that he desired that what he desired most <clears throat> was out of his reach. He believed that he wasn't worthy of love, period. Thinking about the reasons behind his emotions was an unbearing feeling. He never went there. Instead he had another drink. The truth that lived deeper than his conscious awareness and dwelt in his unexplored subconscious mind was that this prostitute made him made him angry because he believed that he <clears throat> that he was it was the only way he could get love. A deep, and deep down he knew it wasn't real love. He hated her because she reminded him that he did not believe he was worthy of love. He had never believed that he was worthy of love. That was why he hated his father, too. He had lived in the same house with that man his whole life and had never felt worthy of his love. He, <clears throat> he didn't simply believe 
that he was worthy of his father's. He didn't simply believe that he was worthy of his father's love. He believed that he wasn't worthy of love, period. He didn't just hate his father because of this. Most of all, he hated himself. Beneath the surface of things, even as, even as he grew, grew up, he had always been tormented by a ferocious sense of inadequacy. Ever since he could remember, he had felt this way and had been tormented by insecurities associated with beliefs of inadequacy. It festered into a world of shame and condemnation and a raging case of unworthiness. Perceived inadequacies had become his prison that isolated him from the possibility of ever receiving love. Regardless of how close and how unconditional that love had always been, he looked out. He looked out of the window at the moon, and he began to think to himself that his loveless existence could never change. His heart overflowed with hopelessness. In response to his broken heart, a silent, glistening tear rolled its way slowly to the corner of his eye. Finally, it started getting better for the crowd as they hear that hearing, hearing, wasting all his wealth. This wicked son in his poverty, not only is he in poverty, he is subject to the ultimate humiliation of being a servant of pigs. Pigs, who, pigs were considered ceremoni ceremonially unclean, and raising pigs was unclean work. This son is now completely defiled and has reached the pinnacle of failure. The crowd is hungry for justice. He didn't go straight to the pigs. The son was addicted to his self-medicating practices that he subjected himself to dis that he did subject himself to desperate acts in order to fund his addiction. These de desperate acts only intensified the consuming conviction of his own inadequacy. Eventually, even the door closed on him. Even the, even that door closed on him. His perpetual oppression by inadequacy, shame, condemnation, and unworthiness made healthy relationships impossible. Everywhere he went, relationships failed, and chaos followed. He had nothing. He had no one. He was homeless. He was broke. He didn't belong anywhere. On top of all of this, he was going through major withdrawals. At the end of himself, he sat down in the shade, his back against the tree, his face towards the tree. The Middle Eastern sun was blazing beads of, of, sweat, of sweat swelled up from his forehead. His tongue dried out inside his mouth. The unsatisfied urges of his alcohol addiction whipped him repeatedly and ruthlessly. The withdrawals caused his body to spontaneously spa spasm and tremble. One of the most high cl one of the high class prostitutes that he had spent so many nights with walked along the streets in front of him, ready to ready for work. His heart rate increased. His blood started pumping. They had shared so many beautiful nights. He called out to her, and she turned. Her 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 eye contact was powerful. Her eyes used to dance, used to dance and hold his gaze with erotic invitations, but today her eyes held no affection for him, no acceptance. Today her eyes were filled, <clears throat> her eyes fueled his in, internal narrative of unworthiness and rejection. Mm. All the facets of, of his money, all the facets that his money had brought him faded like smoke. Despite all the sex and wild moments they had shared, this is what the most vulner this was the most vulnerable she had ever been with him. This was their most honest moment. There was no erotic dance in her eyes. Now the honesty in her eyes shattered the illusions that had once portrayed. The truth in her eyes struck him forcefully. He finally realized the painful truth that the shame inspired hatred that he had felt towards her was perfectly mutual. And then there's some more beautiful artwork. The floggings of withdrawal and the floggings of inadequacy matched, matched each other in their re relentless administration of torture. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually, he was, he was pioneering new depths of internal darkness. His only remaining friend, his only remaining escape, was sleep. Overwhelmed by everything, he lay down in, in the shade and closed his eyes. He slept in... <clears throat> he slept, and the afternoon quietly passed away. Instead of being woken by a sleep terror at this time, he was woken by, by a bearded man, an ugly bearded man. This bearded man was geographically ugly, inside and out. The ugly bearded man kicked him in the leg, hard. The twisted odor of narcissism clung to his ugly beard, uh, clung to this ugly bearded man that stretched, stenched, 
of the pigs he farmed. As the sun's eyes adjusted to the light and, and consciousness, he could make out the eyes of the ugly bearded man who stood above him. The first thing he noticed was the absence of kindness and warmth. Instead, he immediately saw lethal brutality and manipulation flashing in his eyes. The kick in the leg turned out to be a job offer. His only remaining friend, his only remaining escape, was sleep. He got it too, the job that is. He got the job, he, was, he got the only job he was fit for, feeding pigs. There was no minimum wage. There was, he was a glorified slave. The ugly, stingy, bearded man didn't care if this homeless bum lived or died. If he dies, he can be pig food. Until then, this street rat can, street rat can feed my pigs, thought, thought the ugly, bearded man. Wow. I know, right? It was while he was in this dark place that his son began, soon began to come to his senses. He assessed him, so his circumstances and, be, and came the sobering conclusion that if he didn't figure out something soon, he was going to starve to death. But which was worse, starve to death or go back and face his father the way he had publicly betrayed him, dishonored him, and squandered the family's wealth? Then there was the fact that the whole village was prob and probably the whole country wanted him dead. The thought of it instantly released a paralyzing explosion of fear and shame through, the whole, through his whole being. Maybe dying here with the pigs and this ugly bearded boss was better than that. He carried on feeding the pigs and tried to avoid thinking about his father. Time ticked by and famine in the land caused the food supply to, to slow and wither away. The choice the son had to make started to become very, very real. Die of starvation or return to his father and face the consequences, however severe they may be. Again, the thought of it... Oh, I lost my place. Uh, again, the thought of it all right, was like a lightning strike of fear, shame, and negative emotions. The sense of being unworthy that, had, that he had felt before left before he left home was now out of control and coursing throughout his soul like venom. He was persuaded that the darkness he had walked in defined him. His failure to attain moral, perfe moral perfection reinforced his conviction that he was worthless and unloved. His dark secrets tormented him with an ever-present excruciating shame. He decided to spend more time with the pigs and this ugly, ugly bearded boss rather than face his father. Mm. And that is the end of chapter two. So we are good and wow, the play on words on some of that <laughs> was incredible. like they were pretty intense. I mean, to get to that place where to, you choose that over, over yes. facing, over facing the music, over facing I can truth. actually look back at my life and see moments of where I've done that, where I've where I've in, I would rather deal with something just uh, than mm -hmm. to have to admit, mm -hmm. you know, or or to have to face whatever's coming. And half the time, what we think we're fixing to face isn't usually as bad as we imagine it to be. No. Just like this, you know, he goes back in his father's, you know, open arms. That's tough. Yeah. It's really good stuff. I hate to leave it on this note I, because I, it's like I, right I do too. there. I really I do. do too. But I mean, it did something. It's something well, to it's ponder a, it's on. Two to ponder on, you know, to, to make that decision. You know, yeah. continue what you're doing or, or face the truth. I mean, every it is written that everyone will give a conquer of life. And so many times it's like, oh, I have to do this first. I have to do that first. I have to fix this. I have to fix that. Well, it says, well, come just as you are. Yeah. I mean, the point is, we can't do it without Christ. Jesus said, I my own self can do nothing. Yeah. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Really good. So this concludes our first reading. <laughs> <laughs> this concludes our first book reading. Um, we hope you guys and are enjoying the story. Feel free to reach out to us. Yeah, absolutely. Feel free to reach out to us. And um, again, if you would like to join us tomorrow, we'll be back again tomorrow. We don't like to set a time because we like to keep um, 
keep our freedom a little open there and just in case things come up we don't want to promise a time and not be able to get on so we're going to be back tomorrow at some point um and uh, as you all wait in anxious anticipation oh i know it oh, i know it y'all can't, <laughs> can't wait for the next installment Yep. <laughs> so we're going to be reading three and four. If you guys will go download the book, and you can either read it um, on your own or come and join us as we read it tomorrow. Yeah, if you, and if you see this after it's already been live, and you feel feel free to comment or whatever. It's not so much looking for it's not looking for attention. It's looking for fellowship. It's looking yeah. for the body. You know, and I, I think that we as the body need the body, and that fellowship is important. And Christ in you, Christ in me, Christ in others. That should be honored and celebrated. Absolutely. So thank you guys. Thank you very much for joining us and we will talk to you guys tomorrow and we hope you have a wonderful evening.